uh, medium, and he wanted the government to control it. And that has not abated in the, in, in the decades since. Governments look to exercise power. And Dick's point that it only applies to broadcasting makes that point explicitly. We own Channel 7, WJLA here in Washington. We also own News Channel 8, the cable, local 24-hour cable news service. We also own websites for WJLA and News Channel 8, and we own Politico and Politico.com. All of the content regulation of all of those platforms of, of, of media dissemination, content dissemination of all of those, only WJLA is regulated only WJLA. We can put anything else we want unregulated over the other medium. And since Hoover in 1927 to here we are in 2009, there are so many different avenues where people can get their information. The concept of scarcity, if, if it ever had any validity, um, is, is sort of pale in its ghost-like image Comparison in comparison to all of the other medium and all of the other platforms today. Well, do you think the FCC wants to get into those areas, and do you think there's a credible possibility that they will in terms of internet and as far as content goes? I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think that the, the government's going to seek to do that, and I think it'd be very unwise if they were to do so. I think the the wonder of our of our current medium, as I said earlier, is it's so diverse so vast, and, and if you don't like a particular station, you don't like a particular channel, uh, you've got plenty of alternatives out there, and we do tend to find uh, the kind of program that we all want, that each, each of us wants, and uh, I think that's a, a wonderful system. Well, I, I will say that Dick is absolutely right. There's no commissioner, no member of, well, there, there may be a few, but <laughs> no credible member of the government would want to seek direct control over content. But think about all the indirect controls on content that we have. Today, right now, we have a mandate to do X number, three hours of children's programming to children 16 and under uh, on uh, broadcast television today. In broadcasting. In broadcasting, in broadcasting. We have emergency alert system requirements. We have sponsorship identification requirements. We have closed captioning requirements. We have indecency requirements. There are a lot of indirect uh, and direct uh, um, uh, 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 programming requirements. And, and listen to this, the government has set up a hierarchy of preferred programming. Think about this. If we wanted to set, to start use one of our digital subchannels, our you know our Dick talked about going to digital. We have this channel seven seven point zero. You can get a high definition picture of of ABC programming, WJLA programming. We also have two subchannels. One's a weather channel that we have. We we can give twenty four hour weather that we have uh, audio from WTOP radio, and we have another channel that does all reruns of old nineteen sixties television programmings called RTN. Suppose we wanted not to do RTN, and suppose we wanted to have a, a, a channel of 100% local political coverage, coverage of Montgomery County or Fairfax County or the District of Columbia, 100% local editorial, uh, uh, electoral coverage. Everyone here would raise their hand and say, that's in the public interest. That's our definition of the public interest. Yet the FCC says that there is one type of programming that's even better than 24-hour local political coverage. What's that? Children's programming. No matter what you put on your television station, you still have to do three hours of children's programming. So the government directly, this is not an indirect, this is the government directly tells us, broadcasters, because we have this scarce frequency, tells us that we have to have one type of programming preferred over another type of programming. Uh, uh, Dick, could you talk a little bit, and, 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 and certainly Jerry, uh, Jerry touched on it uh, more indirectly, about these backdoor ways of impacting uh, speech in the media, uh, the concern that people have talked about in terms of diversity requirements and the localism requirements. I guess the concern about localism and these advisory boards is that 
you know, regular folks aren't going to go on them, but ACORN activists will, and we know where their agenda lies as opposed to uh, the agenda of, of, of true representatives of the local community. What, what's your view on that? Well, let me start from, the, uh, from the, uh, the standpoint that I think broadcasters provide local programming because they have to, to in order to survive. The one thing that broadcasters have that other media uh, uh, do not foster, and that is that programming in the local community, local news. If you want to find out what the weather is, uh, if you want to find out what the, how the, the capitals did, uh, you know, you, you can get uh, on your local station. And they know they have to do that because that's their, that's their uh, bread and butter, I think, so to speak. So I've looked at these provisions that the commission has to require more disclosure, more localism, as really being uh, questionable because I don't think they're needed. I, I've looked at them less as a stalking horse for the fairness doctrine, uh, but as something that is expensive, that's really unworkable, that would lead to more homogenization of programming rather than diversity, and really more to government uh, direction of what kind of uh, programming that local stations should have. And so I think they're unwise. I, th I think one size does not fit all. And I think uh, to the extent that the government is making a decision in Washington, uh, that we want this kind of programming, uh, I don't think that's the kind of the system that we want in this country, in my view. So I, I personally hope that the government looks very carefully at these provisions. These are just recommendations. They may not become actual regulations, and I'm hopeful that uh, the, the government will recognize that setting up community advisory boards is going to be a very expensive proposition. I think you're right. They don't necessarily going to represent the entirety of the community. Uh, I'm not going to go on one of those advisory boards. Perhaps you're not. And, uh, you know, we, our view may not get heard. So I, I, I just think they're unnecessary. That's the way I see it. I, look, I, as and always. You've got a bunch of stations that will have to have community advisory boards. As what, always, I agree with my that? friend Dick. And, and, <laughs> and you have to ask yourself, what's behind this? Why are they doing this? You know, in the 1980s, we got rid of ascertainment. Ascertainment was this, this very complex process at, at renewal time. You had to do a random phone survey to find out what your community was interested in. You had to go through all of these uh, community leaders, talk to the farmers, talk to the teachers, talk to the clergy, talk to, to you know, gay rights activists. You had to talk to everybody. And if you didn't talk to the right people, then your survey, your ascertainment survey was suspect, and people would file petitions to deny against your license based upon the unfairness of your ascertainment. So form became uh, the important thing, not the substance. And the commission said, look, this is collapsing under its own weight. We think broadcasters are pretty smart people, and we think that the broadcasters can figure out what, what is of public interest in their communities. So we got rid of it. Now they've come back. And this is, let me just list what it is that broadcasters are supposed to now do. This, this is pending at the FCC. It hasn't become a final rule. It hasn't even been sent to the government yet. Well, go ahead, finish your point. Uh, this is what the FCC uh, is going to want broadcasters to, to um, record on a program by program basis, on a segment by segment basis. National, the amount of national news, local station produced news, civic affairs, local electoral, non-network produced programming, local non-news, free PSAs, public service announcements, paid public service announcements, closed captioning, the amount of video captioning, the amount of programming, get this, to underserved community whatever underserved community means, how much free religious programming, and how much emergency programming. That's what the broadcasters are going to have to do on a program-by-program -program basis. Now sit back and ask yourself, why? 